be the thing. Um, yeah. It's great to see so many people out for this, which is the first NAS Distinguished uh, Speaker uh, for 2023. And, you know, the whole point of this is to bring together people from different disciplines. So it's great to see people from psychology, from geography, from political science, from sociology, and I'm probably missing people. Um, and um, on that note, I'm going to introduce and get Martin to introduce our speaker for today. And thank you for being here. Thanks, Vicki. Um, Hi everybody, I'm Martin Horak, I'm in political science for those of you who don't know me. And uh, before we get started and before I introduce our uh, speaker for today, um, I'd like to acknowledge that Western University is located on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabek, the Haudenosaunee, the Lenapewak, and the Chibokta nations, uh, on lands connected with the London Township and Sombra Treaties of 1796, and the Dish with One Spoon Covenant of Wampum. We respect and we affirm the inherent and treaty rights of all indigenous peoples on this land, and we will have and we will continue to honor the commitments to self-determination and sovereignty that we've made to indigenous nations and peoples. We acknowledge the historical oppression of lands, cultures, and the original peoples in what we now know as Canada, and we believe that we should contribute to the healing and decolonizing journey that we share. Now, it's a real pleasure for me today to introduce to you Talia Blockland. Uh, we've had a great day and a half already together with her here, and I am really, really pleased that you know we're at that stage in this global pandemic that we can bring people from overseas again in person. Uh, it's and so Talia is uh, a professor of urban sociology at Humboldt University in Berlin. Um, she's interested in urban inequality. She thinks a lot about the unintended consequences that of intended behavior in terms of social exclusion. Um, she's done empirical work on two different continents, and she has a long list of fabulous publications. The one that I'm most familiar with that I've recently read is her 2017 book, Community as Urban Practice, which is part of what she's going to be speaking from today. Uh, but she's also published a number of other books, and she's published in a variety of leading journals, such as Sociology, Urban Geography, the International Journal of Urban and Regional Research, Sociological Review, and Urban Studies. Um, today she's going to be talking about why cities need a public life. So, Professor Barack Lachlan, come on up and please welcome her. Thank you. It's, um, it's very nice to be here. And I did have a very nice day and a half already, and the reception has been fantastic. Um, so now I have to prove that I'm worth all the effort that I'm putting in, in my visit. Um, and it's good that I have this stand but to hide my legs so you can't see how I keep moving and thinking, can I really do this? So let's give it a try, and if you get lost, then you dare to catch me, right? So, um, when Seymour wrote his essay, on the, metropolis in, on the metropolis as affecting the mental life of this attention for others to protect ourselves against an overload of impulses of the dense urbanity of Berlin in the early 20th century. He reflected on the development of a market-based way of life that sociologists started to lament at the end of so, as the end of social bonds. The arrival of the modern era of rationalization epitomized very much in that kind of idea of the metropolis. The European metropolitan streets for Simon symbolized the monetary coldness of people's relations as sites where we pass each other, blasé. Had Simon be a woman, may he also have described urban life as blasé? Where people rub shoulders with unknown unknown others in public space, there's much more going on than the civic disattention that Goldman later talked about. Female and diverse urbanites always navigate space, urban space, by practices of trusting and caring, or community as practice. 
Say when, for example, in Berlin, if you take a woman or a diverse person, you can take the U-Bahn, that's the underground, the underground in the evening, you see how women always look where other women are standing, and you position yourself on the platform there where the other women are too. That's a practice of trust and care. And practices of distrust are in community. For example, when they encounter experiences of sexual harassment, passing other men, groups of men, are also not exactly moments of the blasé. So, when in one of our research, pro in one of the research project projects that we did on the experience of safety in public space in a Berlin neighborhood, we asked women to point out places to avoid. Well, actually, we asked women to, we asked people to point to places where that they tended to avoid and then ask them why, and then categorize the quantitative data later to figure out what the reasons were. And what you're seeing is a map of places in that particular neighborhood in Berlin that women avoided because they had experiences of sexual harassment there. They did not map Simo's reserve with an overtone of hidden aversion. They mapped violations of their personhood. Women, in other words, move through steady moments of care and uncare and trust and distrust when they struggle entering the tram with a stroller alone, when other passengers react with their toddler screams in the subway or when a daddy is forgotten in the playground. Women do not exclusively experience such moments. But I'm inspired by the Canadian, Dorothy Smith, to think that the standpoint of women may help us see questions in a different way. It may help to see that people in streets, squares, and easily accessible to public institutions of our city do not, indeed, live blasé. Similarly, when we did a project among African Berliners who experienced racism, racism in the street and talked to us about how they felt in certain locations in the city, they were not met by Simo's distance tolerance, but by active dominant whiteness. So in the souls of black folk, also in 1903, like Simo's essay, Du Bois argued that modern, modern life gave black men existence only through the revelation of the other white world. Had urban studies taken black scholarships seriously a hundred years ago, and had Simo been a woman, we may have analyzed the mental life in the metropolis vis-a-vis -vis constant entitlement to trust and distrust. And such entitlements, as Sarah Ahmed has pointed out, are unequally structured even before we enter the public space. So in their recent book on modernity, race, and colonialism, Noah Ha and Giovanni Picker argue that even historically, this idea of the Stadt Luft macht frei, the urban air makes free, badly translated, that, that other Berlin scholar, Max Weber, had referred to in his reading of the city since the late medieval times, makes empirically no sense. Had one paid more attention to the black experiences that their US American colleague Du Bois had documented, the social science may have followed less the line of Simo and Weber. What we learn from this today, then, is that from the standpoint of a woman, me as a woman, Interactions in public space have a whole different set of qualities than that kind of idea of civic attention. Thinking about these qualities then and trying to analyze them as fluid encounters is what I'm going to try and do a little bit today. And I'm developing some ideas about social capital that I would like to share with you and hopefully also enter in some interesting discussion. Well, Georg Simon celebrated essay on the mental life in the metropolis may be overrated and in my view it's time to that we point to the lack of empirical data for his claim there's another idea in Simo's work the sociability as a form of play that may deserve much more of our attention sociability as a form of play as a form of play 
is an important feature of urban life because of the conceptual choices and the methodologies we have developed in social science that we may not have been paying enough attention to. So because the way we've developed our methodologies and our, our doing research, how we do the research, maybe that important feature of sociability has been dropped from our attention. So I will argue that this has created a blind spot in how we developed our thinking on social capital in the last almost 25 years. Yes, I've been around for the last almost 25 years. <laughs> and suggest that we may do something against that. So I will argue that we ought to pay more attention to what I would call fluid encounters. By fluid encounters, I mean unplanned brief moments of relating to others that occur especially when we are on our way to do something else. As the byproduct of what we think of as the things we do in our lives. And then they disappear again. <coughs> Which is why Hutsune, one of my very first graduate students from Belgium in the late 1990s, to whom I, lot of, I owe a lot to her in my thinking about these things, she called them because they're gone again, ephemeral. Fluent encounters are just interactions between people at sites in the city, people who have not met before, may never meet again, but still engage in moments of sociability. So I would like to organize the rest of my talk today along two questions that will hopefully guide us through somehow. And there's two questions that I organize my thoughts to. The first is, are urban public spaces and public institutions enhancing or reproducing social positions? Or in other words, does social capital have a public face? And the second one is, if social relations understood as networks of people in which they are embedded, and that does assume a sense of fixity, do they produce social capital as the literature generally suggests and focuses on, or do fluid encounters matter also for resource access? Now before I start, let me state what I will not do. I'm not making empirical claims about the world, or the entire world, not even about whatever it is, the global north. And I come to share as I was asked to do, some of my thinking on social capital in the city, and I've developed them mostly in the context of the United States of America and Europe, especially the Netherlands, where I'm from, and Germany, where I live and work. And I will also not present you with a coherent research talk, in the sense that I present you the research project and the methods, and then the project as we go along. I will sort of pick and choose various moments of empirical data that, that I've um, written about on other places. So why would it be interesting to take up this notion, this concept of fluid encounters, and think through whether they produce social capital? Access to resources such as information and other forms of support that occurs by virtue of sociabilities that are not social networks. For this, it's important that you see with me what the difference is here on the conceptual level. So roughly speaking, and with a really sort of broad brush, like I'm doing social capital theory like this right now, right? Um, we may say that social capital theory in Anglo-Saxon academia has four approaches from where it subsequently has developed. And many of you may be familiar with these debates, so I go quick. Coleman's approach at social capital is located in relations. Social capital is not a thing that you have. Social capital is located in relations where it develops in, ex in exchange. So that's the core idea of the development of trust in relations. But Pierre Bourdieu, social capital is the access to resources by social networks when social relations can be turned into other forms of capital. So the core idea is that social capital is only capital. It's only capital when it can really be transfer transferable in one of his very complex sort of ideas of fields and blah, blah. We have social theorists here that can explain this to you. We won't go into Bourdieu. 
But the, what we can take from Bourdieu, note that for Bourdieu, social capital functions to create club effects and other forms of social closure. For Bourdieu, social capital wasn't so much an idea of you know nicely connecting on the playground at the park. For Bourdieu, social capital was a form of social closure. And then Putnam, in both his 1987 and 1990s, in the 2000 studies, for Putnam, social capital enables the producti productivity of community life. It's assumed to be good for whole sorts of things, and then in the debate, of course, heavily criticized. And the thing with Bourdieu, with Putnam, is that he has these two things, right? On the one hand, in his book, there is this productivity for community and this kind of you know, we need this civic culture and blah 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 and a lot of stuff and that's what been in the early reception of his work has been sort of served to the side as saying this is romantic, this is not nostalgic, this is this is apparently not true, there's also some critique. What is not criticized so much and what's continued its role in the field is the idea of social capital being either bridging or bonding for individuals. And in my reading of the literature, but the literature is big, so we can certainly discuss this. In my reading of the literature, the strength of research that has most developed is that idea of social networks bridging and bonding. And we know that the bridging and bonding idea has produced an endless stream of work testing under what conditions may social capital or may social capital exist, or under what conditions may it not exist, what affects it negatively, what affects it positively. Is it good for health? Is it good for your mental health? Is it good for your obesity? Is it good for your... It's, there's all sorts of things that you can do with social capital. Network research is often what that type of research is. And that's often variable-based testing, right, of hypothesis. Hypothesis of the amount of social capital and their effects. Following very much also Granovetter's weak and strong ties. The measurement of networks in Europe, in North America, but also in Latin America, for example, in the work of Eduardo Marquez in Sao Paulo, or Felipe Link in Santiago de Chile, has been extremely important in learning a lot about how networks work. The effects of social capital measured often with a general, things like, you know, social capital is then often measured with things like, do you trust others? Uh, with indicators of your network, Sometimes even less precise with items like how well do you know your neighbors or do you have friends? Fluid encounters are not strong ties. And fluid encounters are also not weak ties. Fluent encounters, so to say, require attention for what a lot of service-based social capital literature is no longer paying so much attention to. When Granovetter came up with this distinction between strong and weak ties, he had a footnote that there was also something called absence ties. All that was neither strong or weak, but could not be captured as fixed relationships that one may map in a social network with people remaining unnamed to each other forever. I'm going to try and move this footnote of Granovetter to the central place in our discussion. Putnam had an example in his book of how social capital works. So in his bowling alone, there is an, his thesis is that we all start bowling alone and therefore there's no social capital. Right? It's like, that's the sort of nutshell Wikipedia version of this theory. So, so, but he had a, he has a vignette very early in the book about the bowling, bowling league where John donate, donated Lamert a kidney. A retired hospital worker becomes a kidney from an accountant, accountant. And they've gotten to know each other in the bowling league. And here's the sentence from the newspaper clipping that Putnam used. He casually learned about Lombard's need and unexpectedly approached him. Casual learning. Have we forgotten about that casual learning? 
I'm going to talk in the rest of my time today a little more about this idea that the focus on access of resources as social capital through personal network ties hides that the same set of means may provide a different set of substantive possibilities for different people. Networks, you know, you know how network research works, right? Most of us do, because most of us have a very strong idea of what that is. I can come to you and ask you, who would you ask for legal advice if you needed it? And then I can measure your potential social capital. Or I can ask you, who have you asked for legal advice when you needed it? And then I measure your actual network. And note that I have to assume behind my desk, in my office, that legal advice matters to me. It could also be child care or medical advice or someone who waters the plants. It's not about the legal advice. But it's about the idea that someone sits something somewhere thinking about what items may matter. The question whether we measure networks when we, met, met, when we measure networks, whether we ask questions that are actually relevant to people, is a question that scholars like Mario Small have discussed in his uh, book Someone to Talk to, and that my research group in Berlin has addressed methodologically as well as empirically. Because it's problematic. Once you say, okay, so that's not the way to do it. I can't really ask you about your potential social capital because I can ask you if you know anybody who can water your plants, but you have your IKEA plastic plants, right? So that is not a relevant question to you. So, you know, IKEA sells these plants from plastic? That's what I mean. Then you don't need someone to go and water them, right? Because they don't grow. And so, um, so Today, I don't want to go in that direction, even though there is a huge sort of question that we can ask what the alternative may, may be, and we can maybe in the discussion talk about what we thought would be a solution to that. I want to turn the lens slightly in a different angle. While being able to name someone to talk to from a knitted web network may be valuable to some, others may value fluid encounters more than such fixed networks. The woven fabric of sociabilities and fluid encounters that also determines urban life can exist entirely outside of your WhatsApp group contacts and your address books in your phone. And this reflects another point I wanted to make about the need to think about social capital outside of the frame of the fixity of social networks. When people do things to enhance their social capital, in the sense that Pierre Bourdieu has talked about. It is known that the work of social capital is to ex exclude, as I said, to create what Bourdieu called club effects, to ensure that within a field, resources remain within a certain class in order for this class, this group, this, to reproduce its social positions, right? Now, it was nice that you said in the introduction, I'm interested in the unintended consequences of the intended behavior, because I'm also interested in the unintended consequences of the intended behavior the other way around. So it does not have to be intentional. Okay? You don't have to think that the fields in which people with certain positions seek to produce and reproduce themselves are intentionally focused on keeping other people out. So, you may hear people tell sometimes now that their, kinder, their children are already best friends since they were very small, since kindergarten. Now most of you are not old enough. Or maybe you are old enough. I have no idea. That was a bad sentence. I think better. <laughs> so, um, if you imagine that we say that, right? Children are best friends since they were very small, since they were kindergarten. Just recall who organized the play day. I interviewed two mothers in a large project on how mothers, by which I mean people who are read as women who take care of dependent children, in different neighborhoods in Berlin, and how they organize resources for their children. And Alexa and Sophia had met at the baby yoga. And their children were friends since they were born. 
Alexa and Sophia have started to share notes on which daycare center has the best setting, especially with regard to vegetarian food and the child's teacher ratio. Other mothers reported that they went together to the toddler's early childhood music lessons where they discussed which elementary school had the best engaged teachers. These mothers <coughs> are keeping resources among those in equal social positions as their cultural capital and their economic capital that makes them engage in baby yoga or early childhood music lessons create social capital as they access each other's resources. In this sharing, the cleaning, link, cleaning lady, the cleaning person, who may come at night to vacuum clean the hardwood floors of the yoga studio and disinfect the yoga mats so that the hygienic standards are met, does not walk out of that building with that time of knowledge. And that is the exclusionary consequence of how social capital works. Also note that social capital is not a matter of being nice and solidary and caring for one another. It may, but it happens as a byproduct of other things. No matter how nice, progressive, the yoga moms, Alexa and Sophia, their sharing of notes on kindergartens is not locked in the yoga studio, it's locked in their relations. And there's something that inherently makes social capital do the work of creating cities. There's nothing, there's nothing, nothing, that inherently makes social capital do the work of creating cities just or solidary or anything that may be a political ideal. This is why Mike Savage and I have threads in a book that we wrote in 2008 that exclusionary social capital fails to significantly resolve the problems of poor residents while strengthening the position of the advantaged and the exclusionary character of network-based social capital follows from the increased forms of segregation, ghettoization, and seclu seclusion in cities. And after years of segregation and gentrification in cities, which has reduced the social economic diversity, at least in Berlin, in certain urban areas, the social economic diversity. It may also help to take a critical lens to look at many of those neighborhood improvement, locally based community activities and the like that seem to sort of be on the rise. Sometimes in the context of this 15 minute city, sometimes motivated by a fear for ecological disaster, sometimes motivated by an appeal for more urban cohesion, but this may just be me, but when we first create a city with islands of difference along lines of race and class, and then start to plead for the neighborhood as the basic unit of community life, such talk about the community is an effective way of inward orienting the reproduction of social capital among those who dare a match of habitas, habitus and habitat in bourgeois sense that creates a special profit, but does not, and I repeat, does not automatically produce the sort of fluid encounters that I'm trying to think of. So the idea that networks are going to be the bridges that will do the trick of overcoming deep social divisions and who has access to what is put mildly highly optimistic. Empirical research has not confirmed that mixed residential environments in Rotterdam, the Netherlands, for example, create mixed networks. And where it did in the Netherlands, mixture in race and ethnicity, in the sense that people were categorized as ethnic minorities, for example, Turkeys in Turkey, from Turkey, had networks with those who belonged to the white Dutch majority. When there were such networks, we found that in a paper that we did quantitatively with Glenn van Eyck, we found from the statistical analysis that the ties to people who, who, from a minority, we did have ties to people from an ethnic ma majority where people were, were higher positioned in social economic class than the whites that they had relationship with. So that the potential social capital was not necessarily growing easily. 
Alexander Curley from the University of Boston at the time has shown in a chapter in our book Networked Urbanism that when people with relatively speaking strong resources in information, relatively speaking, strong resources, in information, money, material goods like having a car or some bureaucratic skill, living in strongly networked neighborhoods with high poverty levels in the United States, when they had really strong networks and they had some resources, they benefited from moving out. They benefited from a move to another place of residence because, pay attention, they lost their networks. No longer being embedded in strong networks meant that they no longer had to engage with taking care of everybody else and sharing their resources and doing all these things in what she calls draining social capital. So when network-based social capital is inwardly oriented, as in the example of the middle class women in Berlin, and may become draining social capital in strong networks in high poverty neighborhoods in Boston, that Curly analyzed, what about casual learning elsewhere in the city? And I developed the thesis that the potential of fluid encounters may help us think about this more. And that the streets and their equivalents are indispensable for this purpose. The word indispensable is from Asaf Bayad. My drive to address this is also related to concerns that I developed even more strongly during the pandemic. We have seen, all of us, a number of ways in which the pandemic was framed. One in particular has been that digitalization is a chance. Remember that one? I'm not going to go down the road of what one could say about this in its entire, in entirety, but I want to mention one particular aspect. And it's related directly to the example of the yoga model, the mothers with the yoga studio. It was a trope that turning to digital, digital was saving time and much more efficient in many cases, and people looked forward to doing certain things digitally forever. So what I've presented here are a few quotes from two brief interviews with two middle class women, mothers, as a women, people seen as women who are taking care of dependent children. Middle class mothers during the pandemic, that at a point in time that the restrictions of what was sort of, we had like a partial lockdown in Germany, it was never a full lockdown, but many things were closed, schools were closed, childcare centers, playgrounds, and you were not supposed to go out with more than two people. Um, we are interviewing them at the moment that those restrictions were being lifted. And in a G German elementary school, it is regulated by state that it has to have at least, each classroom has to have this PDA meeting. So I think this is quite similar in, in North America. So such meetings, everybody who has been to one knows that they can go on quite long, especially in a school where parents are, part of parents are well educated and have high expectations of what the school is supposed to do for their children or where everything from the destination of class trips to what counts as sugar and does what should or not be should, should, should be or should not should, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> what, sh what should or should not be a snack in school, that can be endlessly discussed. So the meetings are structured, right? They have chairs, they have agendas, they have protocols, and everybody takes them really seriously. But they're also a bit ambitious as they also seen as a space where parents should be able to share their views. Now when they went online, they changed. It became much more easier to keep the line of speakers and to avoid that people react directly to each other because you know, you can mute and unmute. We all know this. <laughs> now we all know this. So this mother commented that she thought it was wonderful that all that inefficiency was curbed in the quickly working down of the agenda and receiving the information. Another woman, a jewelry artist who had given up her work to be a full-time mother and married to a lawyer working for the state, who had juggled the many scheduled, uh, ticket, scheduled activities of her four children before the pandemic, really enjoyed that she didn't have to do that anymore. And generally enjoyed the fact that she could cocoon away from society with her own folks. Her husband, who was responsible for international environmental law for the, Berlin, for the federal state, finally, finally didn't have to go on work trips anymore, and they loved having each other around as a family. 
Another mother of three children with whom I engaged in a conversation while visiting a high-rise housing project on the edge of the city. That's the, the so this is the two middle class quotes, and that's the LC is the, is the lower class um, um, housing project person. Just at the border, it's just at the border of, of Berlin State, and right there because there was the wall, so it's high-rise buildings, and there was the wall, so it goes right into the fields. So there's a field there where the where the wall needs to be, uh, used to be. Um, and I was I was visiting that area. I had a reason for visiting that area because we've done statistics to see where people had the smalling, smallest living space in the city, and then we did some analysis statistically with that. And then I realized I really had to walk the blocks because I'm that kind of person. I can't just do the numbers. I need to do the other parts. So, so I engaged in this conversation while visiting there. Um, and she was a single mother living on the elevator with her children, one, one about five maybe, and one still in a stroller, in an area with the most cramped living conditions. It's 17 square meters in comparison to 70 square meters in the, biggest, um, in the area that has the biggest living size. She never went anywhere when her kids were off school. She could not afford to, nor did her friend who was with her with the children. The things they did every day when there was a vacation and the weather permitted was bag a few, pack a few bags of ch chips, some sodas and a blanket and go to the field where the kids could run around and did not get on her nerves. So the lockdown was a long summer vacation. She had taken the neighbor's kids too when they met her because her mother could not take care of her and she had taken the dog of another neighbor. Because with them being quite a group, big group, she had heard that one was not supposed to go out with more than two people, so they thought if we walk the dog, they just say they're all walking the dog of the neighbor together in case the police would come. Now these three quotes illustrate that while some middle class parents commented on how things were more efficient and they didn't lose time in socializing, the waiting through the day that kids were off school had not been so different for the family from the housing project. Life always has its limitations, the limitations of relative poverty in the German welfare state, and in the two middle class quotes, they celebrated the change, the pandemic as a chance to make something, things more efficient by doing them digital. But here's the point. Taking out the wasting of time of the middle class mothers by making school meetings digital did have consequences for fluid encounters. They did not take place. And when they did not take place, and all we had was network-based social capital in already existing weak and strong ties of people who could contact each other by video or phone call, then the casual learning about something, the casual learning about the other person's needs was affected. Nobody was wasting time with anyone anymore together. That may be very efficient. And of course, it may also reduce, especially women's workload. I raised three of those. And man, these PDA meetings go long. <laughs> so I'm not claiming that wasting time is, generally speaking, a good idea. If I waste more time in my life, I may not be speaking here, right? So all I'm saying is that wasting time together with people from whom you do not really know anything who you do not really know or maybe just don't know at all can be very resourceful. When social capital is only formed inwardly oriented within existing social networks, then for example, the lower middle class parents cited in the middle here, the LMC, um, who told me in an interview in the Mothering Project that I mentioned before, before the pandemic, would not have found the music teacher because she overheard others talk about it. She harvested information from a gathering where she heard something that was not meant for her. Now this is a small example, but you may think it further, as it also applies in other spheres. Interviewing how the lockdown affected the work of social workers, teachers, and police officers 
we just went nuts. We did so much empirical work during the pandemic. It was this. So we did another project in which we were interviewing these people. And we talked to a social worker who works for a sexual violence prevention project for boys. And that's in an area where the socioeconomic uh, deprivation is relatively high. And the, what they call, what the social workers call the emotional deprived, emotionally deprived households are also concentrated. And they have an issue there with young men becoming victims of older men preying on them. Now this is a taboo. This is a topic that cannot be talked about, that is difficult to talk about. That is something that's usually, in his words, under the radar. Things under the radar need to be sensed, he said. And that's what I quote shows, the, 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 the one on the right, the social worker. In the right corner, finally, I quote a Syrian refugee who was still waiting to be legalized, legal, sorry, who was still waiting to be legalized, but had found work in a kebab house where he did the dishes. A job in an Iraqi cook in that restaurant had helped him get. And I was chatting to him, and he described how they had met. The cook from Iraq had casually overheard him speaking the same regional language when he was socializing in some sort of pizza restaurant. And then one thing led to the other. All this depended on casually learning something. The unintended transmission of a resource, the unintended transmission of a resource, from one person to another that no one had planned, that they would never be able to tell us about, had we come with our survey of who they thought was going to support them. Their potential social capital was waiting in public space, not in their social networks. That latter example of the Syrian refugee also brings attention to another aspect. The fixity of social capital in social networks assumes that such networks are somehow in place. And it doesn't really teach us much about how those networks come about put provocatively, provocatively, especially when it is also connected to the idea that specific locations where people live for a long time are a precondition, a prerequisite for developing good quality networks. We treat people like trees, as if they have roots. And as if not having roots is a deficit, a default something that needs to be talked about or researched by genetic tests. The fixity of social capital includes the idea that it emerges out of the embeddedness in social work networks or out of a community embedded in place as a result of long residencies, solidarity, inter solidarity interactions, friendly care practices. It assumes that the standard of people's organization of resources is one of being rooted rather than having roots. But many people have more roots than they have roots. In Berlin, half of the registered population has not been born in the city. The biggest alternative first birthplace is Hamburg, 200 kilometers away. And then Damascus, Syria. But most people come from a great, great, great many other places. And if you've mapped them, you'd see an extremely diverse map. The importance of migration in uh, the migration for our cities in Europe definitely, at the moment, international migration has inspired me and my students also to think about more more about how these perceptions of social capital and how we measure them are quite Eurocentric. It was out of a study from how young people get things done in a comparison between Abidjan in Ivory Coast, Hyderabad in India. Jakarta in Indonesia and Berlin in Germany with Abdul Malik Simon and Hannah Schilling that his work on African cities that we have come to, that the work of Malik on African cities has helped us sharpen this lens. In the study of African cities, scholars have long moved away from fixed ethnicity, fixed households, fixed kinship towards an understanding of practices of improvisations. Referring here to the title of Abdul Malik Simon's latest book, Maybe he read, written another one since then, actually. He writes a lot. For Berlin, we 
we've studied this in the practices of sub-Saharan migrants and how they get things done in the city. And uh, Rebecca Arter, who has written a, a chapter on this in our book, uh, Creating the Unequal City, uh, reports of an interview that she has with one of her interview partners, Melanie. And the, interviews, uh, the interview asked, I once asked somebody, how do you know this person? And he said, oh, you know, he's African. I just saw him on the street and we started talking. So Melanie, does this also happen to you? And Melanie answers, yeah, sometimes. Then we're going. You're going shopping. You can meet somebody. Hello, guten Tag. That means hello. And he says, guten Tag. And then he starts talking to you. You cannot go when somebody is talking to you. You have to stand still so that you hear what he's saying. So you just stand there, and you can hear what he's saying, and give the answer, and he again, and you talk again, and you give the answer, and before you move, yeah, it can happen. If you don't know that person, you may have to talk. If you don't know that person, you may have to talk. Rewind and repeat. If you don't know that person, you may have to talk. It happens anytime. It happens to me, it happens to me, to me anytime. Somebody greets you, you see, you cannot go like, you cannot go when somebody's talking to you. So improvisations, one could say, are moments in which fluid encounters become rich in social capital. We call that social capital for common resides in relations, and we don't have it. By consequence, the unintended consequences of gathering may be harvesting from resources passing by and through, as we argued with Schilling and Simone in a paper in the Social School Review. And I cannot expand on this entirely here now, but let me just put it out there. So it's one of my main arguments in the Communities Urban Practice book, that this also means that community can be thought of as a practice, as an urban practice, rather than a certain network in a specific place and that as a practice, it conceptually may include solidarity and warm sentiments and things like being nice and liking each other, but it doesn't have to. But it always includes sociability. Communities urban practice may also follow without good intentions, but it will never follow without sociability. Now hang on, so we're soaking off community from location, we're soaking off social capital from fixed networks, what about space then? I certainly want to maintain conceptually the idea that social capital has a spatiality, but not in terms of territoriality. Maintaining conceptually the idea that social capital has a spatiality is spatial. In my, few, few, in my view, means the following. Social capital is not embedded in locations, but in relations. And we need to pay attention especially to ephemeral relations between people that come and go and ebb and flow and are emerging from improvisations in the moment. But this coming and going and ebbing and flowing is taking place in spatial arrangements between people in daily routines. So these spatial arrangements matter for who gets to learn about what and how, and thus how resources access, access to resources is distributed. And I think we need a conceptual toolbox to think about and study and analyze in the which spatial arrangements these fluid encounters are most likely to be productive. Can we say anything at all about the conditions under which this may be the case? Following on, among others, the work of Lynn Lofton and Cloud Fisher, I suggest to sketch two axes that represent two things that I believe matter. The axis of access, the axis of access, no, no, I need to work, to, to work my English, but I've learned that in Canada everybody works on their English, so that's okay. <laughs> the axis of access, of getting in, how public is a certain urban site? And the axis of privacy, how much control do we have over information that other people have about us? 
Well, we can talk for a long time about public, and, and it's nothing to do with public ownership. And, uh, the shopping mall in Sao Paulo for many urban youth is more public than the street because the police is not allowed to get into the shopping mall. So it's not so easy, it's not that easy. So the access of access is, is how easy is it to get in and out. The access of privacy, maybe I need to spend a few more words on that access because this is one that is slightly counterintuitive. Recall how Simo believed that anonymity is a setting of reserved individuals who move along each other without recognizing, without acknowledging. I, produce, I propose to do this slightly differently and define a continuum from anonymity to intimacy, not by how well we are loved or how warmly we are hugged, but by how much control we have over information to reveal about ourselves. This draws inspiration from something that some of you may remember and others may not, the television series Cheers, which is placed, placed in a bar in Boston. And if you don't know this, then you, you can, I, I, I think it's in YouTube. And, and it's the absolute opposite of Friends, which everybody still watches, at least in my house, right? So um, Cheers is placed in a bar in Boston in the 1970s or so. But it's also inspired from a very first article in the very early issue of the Journal of American Sociology called The Saloon, written by Ernest Moore in 1897. Our privacy is high in settings of public life, as we can engage with others in relatively strong control over what we reveal about ourselves and what we do not. And even though this is initially counterintuitive, try hiding something from your partner, and you know exactly what I mean. You'll be caught, if not now, then later. Where you reveal something, somewhat, about yourself in fluid encounters with others, you don't give your entire situation away. In communications with people where you do not have to fear the social consequences of gossip, shaming, blaming and the like. It doesn't matter what they think about you because they're not going to be in the, there in the next moment. So it's the absence of this generalized reciprocity that actually makes those kind of relationships work. In settings where you see others, maybe more than once, but not so often, that you really get to know them. And in that fluid sort of way, may it be that there, where network analysis of strong and weak ties would not find ties at all, a public familiarity emerges that is good enough for some transfer of resources, but banal enough, enough of sociability in the form of play, as Simon said, to be relatively unimportant for everything that may play a role in friendships, close relations, and long-term connections. So let me here then return to Gary Simo. Sociability, Simo writes, is the play form of association without content or intent and no result outside of itself. From which nothing but the satisfaction of the impulse to sociability is to be gained in its intentions. While social, sociable interaction centers, centers upon persons it can occur only if the more serious purposes of the individuals are kept out. So that it is an interaction not of complete, but of symbolic and equal personalities, the members of the bowling league. Casually learning. Because the partial engagement, partial engagement, not the full engagement, not the entire solidarity, not the care, not the love, not all these things, the partial engagements in fluid encounters may open possibilities for casual learning that we'd not have if we came to know each other. The importance of Simmel's comparison of sociability to play may be clarified by one example. Say you're a medical doctor and I film of cars at the petrol station. Do you still have people filming cars at the petrol station? <laughs> That's why I saw a bad example. <laughs> My mother is sick, 
and I need some advice as which clinic to turn to. Now we both go to every home game of the local soccer team. And through that routine, we create a setting of public familiarity with everybody around us. As we stand waiting for the game to start, when we have to pass each other with the beers without spilling it over you, that that's kind of the, 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 we waiting in line and the crowd stands for the beers. And one day, when you ask me how I am, as we casually do, you learn that I'm not so well because I worry about my mom. We may never extensively have talked about the rest of our lives outside of the stadium, but when it then occurs, you may say something. And you may speak from your expert. You're the medical doctor, remember? You may say something, and you may speak from your expertise. You may speak from your experience. And even if you never told me that you're a medical doctor, I may still walk away with something out of that stadium that I did not have when I walked in. In the survey that we did under COVID, we looked at two soccer teams. We asked people what they missed most during the pandemic. And one of the things that came out very strongly were, was one particular football team in Berlin. And the other one was not so mixed. <laughs> now, that's because the other one is better than the other. <laughs> but that was not the point. We had another question that we asked people. We asked people, do you ever talk to strangers when you go to the stadium? And do you encounter people? We ask this for everything, right? From opera to bars and everything that was close. We listed everything that was close and asked people to rank, rank these things, how strongly they missed them. And then we asked them, did you ever, do you ever, when you did go there, did you ever talk to anybody who you never known before? And, or do you meet people that you only eat there, that you don't eat anyplace else? And the variable that, exp the, the thing that explains the two teams being ranked it's not that one is number three and the other one is the last, the, the last in the Bundesliga at the moment, almost was. The reason is, in one team, the supporters in one stadium reported much higher scores on this question, yes, I talk to people that I don't know, and yes, I have people that I only meet there. So that confirms for me empirically that thinking about this question of the byproduct of fluid encounters, the byproduct of something else, the casual learning out of casual exchange, that that is the public life of social capital. And the idea of seamless sociability is interesting here, because we may read this text as suggesting that is especially because for all those weeks, all those months, all those years that we cheered together in the stadium, we remained in a relational setting of public familiarity in which whatever else we wear, the rest of our personalities was not an issue. It is the byproduct of something else, the casual learning and the casual exchange. How then? Maybe translate this into further research. First, I suggest that we take social capital away from the idea that it always needs to be measured by access to resources through networks as I think I've abundantly argued so far. Secondly, I'd like to suggest that we study urban settings with a comparative gesture, to quote Jennifer Robinson, that can be theorized as sites of public familiarity. <coughs> as a specific combination of access and privacy control in street life, which may be different depending on the context of where we are. Third, such an approach should include questions of space, as the casually learning requires a thrown togetherness. It requires a co-presence. It requires that somehow we end up being in the same location, in a spatially defined relation of our bodies leaving our houses. Our urban life in the COVID-19 data that we're currently analyzing suggests that the loss of an urban fabric woven by fluid encounters of sociability in lockdowns affected people differently, depending on their social status. People 
affected people along lines of inequalities that are also found in relation to other urban resources. That is, people with low income, low educational attainment, small living space, depended even more before the pandemic on casual meetings with others than on social networks to get things done. And we have papers coming out in this and so we have sort of developed a measure and a tool with which we think we can make that empirical, that claim empirical. Thus the public life of social capital comes to a standstill when COVID-19 restrictions were imposed on cities. As the people's infrastructure, in Simon's word, becomes hard to maintain. An interview, to, interview data from the Modern the Metropolis project from which I briefly referred to have told us that the public life of social capital also suffers from seclusion and the digitalization opens up a possibility to increase those patterns of seclusion. In short then, it's precisely the partial engagement in fluid encounters that may open up possibilities for casual learning that we not have if we came to know each other. To conclude then, let me answer my first question. As I said, that that would guide us through. Does social capital have a public face? Yes. For people's practices of organizing resources and enhancing or reproducing their social positions when they do boundary work and engage in practices of seclusion, and it has a public face, while fluid encounters guarantee nothing. We cannot engage well, so it has a public face. While, while fluid encounters guarantee nothing, we cannot engage in solidarities, in caring, in sharing, in repairing, through small talk and nothing talk, without everyday fluid encounters in streets and their conceptual equivalents. To the second question, then, to conclude, if social relations understood as networks of people in which they are embedded and this assumes a certain fixity produce social capital, do fluid encounters matter for resource access? Yes, fluid encounters, ma encounters matter for resource access, even when the standard operationalizations of social capital tend to focus on social networks and fix it to certain locations. Now the operationalization of how get things get done which include such fluid encounters, of course, is not an easy task. But it cannot be that 25 years in social capital, we're gonna say, oh, it's, we don't have the variables, or we don't know how to operationalize it, and therefore we don't pay attention. Because after all, the task is not to run another regression, the task is to understand the world. And finally, yes, fluid encounters matter for resource access as they contribute to what Asaf Bayat has called the indispensable street. Algorithm-driven social media are a limited alternative to the utterances in public space. The listening to what you do not think you want to hear. And that's required, according to Bayard, for any form of popular activism that is not at all erratic. In that sense, the public life of social capital is necessary from a political perspective for urban futures as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we have uh, about 25 minutes, I think. Um, yeah. Uh, time for questions. Uh, uh, would you like to kind of manage the own, your own discussion, or would you want me to somehow intercede? Um, You're the boss. <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> I can play the boss. Uh, questions? <laughs> so, I was interested in your, your two axes right, of, of uh, 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 privacy and access. And I can see how where we're, uh, public and intimate intersect to create these, these uh, opportunities that you talk about. I can see where public and anonymous intersect, that's sort of the world of, of Zimmel's uh, reserve and, and uh, indifference. Uh, and I can see where the private and the intimate intersect. That's the world of maybe of the household or the, the close friend. But I, I was just curious if you could comment on where the private and the anonymous come together on your, your two axes. What, what is that 
look like or mean? And what, what is it, what can it help us understand maybe analytically? I think I tried to turn this into a two by two table. Yes. You know, so, yeah. <laughs> Which is not what it is. Okay, all right. And there is a two by two table that I could draw on social yeah. touch, which is this is that's that's the Urban Bones book. The, the, so so so, but it's good that you ask me a question because it shows that the visuals do, don't work. Okay. Because it makes you think that it is either one. But I really want to understand it as a continuum where 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 we sort of. So it should be not two arrows. It should just to be two. To interfaces, there's one field of stuff, and there's another, you know, there's one field of what is public and private that sort of has two outer points, and then there's another field, and you know, to lay these over another somehow. I don't. It's a good question. I don't think I've thought that through because I wanted to just say my intention with it was what was to take away the idea that the private is the intimate, that when you're in a, so when I'm home. I can lock the door, and you don't have access. So, but it's not. It is. It is. You cannot have access, but I don't have control. So it's the, that's where I, when I said it's counterintuitive, because it assumes that at my home I, I'm not in control of what I can reveal about myself. That my sense of being who I want to be is higher when I go outside than when I'm at home. So it's also a critique on a sort of romanticized notion of home. It's not an answer to the question. I'll think about it. Okay. Thank you. Well, yeah, I'm wondering about these um, apps that try and sort of replicate neighborhoods or almost replicate the fluid encounters, like that app that's called Next Door, where you know, you get these messages from people in your neighborhood, and half of them are like pretty irrelevant. But but you still have all this information passing by you. It is usually linked to a location in some way. Um, but can it replicate the public or the public spaces that are not digital? Do you think? I, 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 it's a good point. Thank you for that question. And it is. Um, the, 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 the learning something that wasn't intended for you works, I think, very well in those kind of, the one that we have is called Living Un, and you read people writing about stuff, and it's not for you, but you can still read the conversation. So that is, and uh, presuming, pres when we can assume that those apps are constructed in such a way that they don't go, that they, and I'm not sure that they are, that, that they don't, that there's enough mixture of different type of resonance within that, in that they always have this space, and the space that my neighborhood is in is quite strange because it doesn't match at all with what you would sense as a neighborhood. So how those kind of things are drawn, I don't exactly, but it's a very good question. We've looked at, we've looked at the role of those kind of networks under the pandemic, um, and the student that did that master thesis, um, I wish I could just, but we have, like, we have many students. Um, Laura, Laura Fifter, Laura Fifter is here. She looked at this, the way in which Nim and Ande, which is one of those networks, produced new forms of social support during the pandemic. And that, but that takes it already further, because I'm not making claims about social support. I'm just thinking about the casual learning. Right. So I think for that, it would certainly makes sense. In terms of can I replace the, the thrown togetherness of urban space, I think the point that is sort of on the last slide of a Sefraya, which is an entire other aspect of why I think fluid encounters matter. So I have to finish a book proposal by Monday on to hopefully get a grant to finally write the book up. But that is the next step for me, to think about, well, what, what type of, we were having a conversation before the break about, uh, before the talk. <laughs> the talk was the break. <laughs> <laughs> so, the, the, that we had a, a conversation about how how important it is that whether it's important that that so we were talking about about your work and about how this 
it, you know, you can develop an app of uh, people then say how happy they are when they're on the road, for example. And I was asking, well, is that is that really important, or is it really important that we have fluid encounters that are not necessarily happy moments, but that teach us something about how to be civic? And that is that is the next step. So yes and no. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for your talk. So I have a question um, to maybe invite you to speculate about the, the future of these fluid encounters. And I'm particularly thinking of some of your opening remarks about concerns with safety and public safety and the extent to which maybe people are really avoiding these yeah. fluid encounters because uh, they're so charged, right? Uh, particularly um, now, like I'm originally from Western Canada and just the media is just full of like all of these, this coverage of these stranger attacks all the time. And then I, uh, just picking up on the last points about apps and I think about the platformization of so much of public life um, that we can now just, we don't even need to go into a grocery store, right? You can just have somebody go and do your shopping for you, deliver it to you within 10 to 15 minutes, and you never need to interact with them because you can instruct them to just leave it at your door, right? Or you order something yes. from, right? You order your meal to be delivered on demand, same thing, right? You never, you don't need to come into contact with the restaurant. Exactly. You don't have these casual no, learning exactly. encounters, you know, in those spaces. And again, you don't even need to interact with sort of the, the, the gig worker who delivers the meal yeah. to you. So, yeah, I'm, I'm interested in, in your thoughts about what, what are the features that's, that's of these very good I'm interested in that because that is exactly what, what the first paragraph of this big proposal that was just about says. That, there is, <laughs> that, that I think that there's a real risk mm -hmm. in this and that we're not seeing it. That there is a, this digitalization is, yeah. is, is, is very convenient and it's really nice to sit on the sofa and cuddle with your loved ones and have the food delivered. Someone is delivering it. You know, this, the dual city that you were talking about the other day is getting an entirely new, new dimension. But I also think that, that, that the, the, there's a book from 1984 by, by Jacques Ellul called The Technological Bluff. And this was way before the internet. But it's an argument about how technology becomes its own belief system. And just because we are able to do it doesn't mean we have to. And, and I think we've written a blog during the pandemic about people going to sort of more do more digital things, saying, you know, just because you're capable of doing it doesn't know you have to. There's consequences of these kind of things. So, so um, my thesis would be that this increased use of digitalization is a digital divide. Some people can do it to other people deliver it to you. And in Germany, that delivery part is racialized. Oh yeah, no, it's my yeah, friend. Yeah, it is here too. Yes, yeah. you know it's free, and and this the that so it's an idea, right? And I haven't even written it, so so it's I wish this is I'm not sure if I want this to go on YouTube. You can cut this. So and <laughs> but if we go on doing that, we create this public safety. Because if we assume that there is, and I'm going to go on, I'm going to skate on very slippery ice now. So, so bear with me if I slip into saying something that is entirely politically correct. There is a certain interaction in public space that people that have a lot find annoying or interpret or even as dangerous, or could potentially even be dangerous. Of course, it's not so dangerous as. You know, when there was this Toronto stabbing in this public system, you have the news for like two hours about how this is, the public system is now in saving public transport, and there's even a word for people that use it, as if there's people that use it are slightly different than normal people. They're called, what is the public transport system called again? TTC. 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 Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then they're called, it's called T, is it again? TTC. Yeah, and then they've told, spoken in the news about TTCers, like people that use public system as if they're public transport, as if they're some kind of crazy spaces. So, so that is all part of that. But besides, it all, it is also I think is the sense that if you have enough
people doing things properly. You can have a certain amount of people doing not things properly. You know, if you have a school class full of children doing what they're supposed to do, you can have two that do not. But you cannot have 20, because it's going to be a mess. So, so, and I don't know how to transfer this idea now to public space, but I think there is something about mass, and I think in that sense there is a lot when Louis Wirth was saying, you know, heterogeneity and density. Heterogeneity and density belong together. You can't have heterogeneity without density. It can't make a city work. You need to have the dense use in order to, for the heterogeneity to not completely divide people up. And that would be the direction I would be thinking of. So, so the digitalization causes the brutalization and not the bad behavior. So not the bad behavior causes the brutalization. It's the digitalization and people keeping outside of public space that creates, and it goes in the direction of what Edkin Anderson has argued years ago in a paper called um, The Padded Bunker that was published in Urban Studies. But I don't know the year. Two questions there and there. So probably two. Yeah, and I was, maybe, I guess, my question was about that connection between heterogeneity and density. And yeah, where, and I guess about, well, size, relatedly, in terms of, you know, there are places where these fluid encounters would be less likely to happen, that are smaller, where people have maybe more roots than roots. Um, so I'm just wondering about, like, if you think about applying these concepts to those places or how, how that works. Because I'm thinking of, even in a place like London, right, it's hard, and maybe this is the dual city thing talking, right, as a privileged white man, but it's hard for me to, I don't go often places where I have complete anonymity in that, you know, if I'm taking my child somewhere, chances are I'm going to know someone there, and even if I'm talking in a group of people, like someone knows me in that group of people, so I can't be, you know, totally my true self. Uh, so, yeah, that's kind of a rambling question, but I'm just wondering if there's, yeah, when there's more homogeneity and less density versus more heterogeneity and more density, like, you know, these fluid encounters probably happen less. So if you're kind of seeing that in any of the work that you're doing or if you have any thoughts or observations about that. Yeah, I think you're sharing your thoughts because when people give me thoughts, I always have some. And uh, so, so that's a gift. And that this element of what I said, you know, I, I kind of skimmed over this saying, you know, generalized reciprocity doesn't really matter. And I think in larger urban settings, generalized reciprocity doesn't really matter. But that doesn't mean that everything is anonymous in the blessing. And that was sort of where I wanted to go. And I, but I do think that generalized reciprocity, like if you, if you always are in settings, because the size of the city, where someone knows you, you're not necessarily, so I'm not going to be nice to her because, because, because of her, because you don't know her. But I know she's a student, and I know him. So, 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 so my being nice to people is not because of the people, it's because of this other thing. But if this other thing is not there, mm -hmm. I think a lot of the urban studies, sort of in my reading of it, I may be wrong, but has then said, oh, then it's public and anonymous. And I don't think that that's the case. And I was, because I think that that's where those fluid encounters become very important. And in the book, I have another concept that I haven't, I've kind of packed away for today, like you haven't seen it. Mm -hmm. So, which is durable engagement. And that is the idea that if I go to certain settings, even though, yeah, so this is why I was hesitant, because that's another idea. Right. That there is a way in which I can engage in certain activities but when I go again and someone else takes my place, that activity continues. And that would be, so I'm kind of, and I have taken it out, and, and I may have to drop it all together because maybe it doesn't really work, but it worked quite well in communities over practice because I had these two things. And then, but, but your PDA meeting wouldn't necessarily be in that theory of fluid encounter, it would be more of a durable engagement and that would then apply to it. Hi. Sorry. Okay. So first, I just want to recap. Sorry, if I can just restate your point uh, for about the maps. This right. idea that like, what do we do with the fact that like a majority of the of the kind of the social um, the way that like 
That they negate that they these need, kinds yeah, of fluid yeah, encounters, right? Because this is just yeah. kind of the reality. And then the, the question, the, the answer was like, well, there's the technological bluff, and just because something can be done this way doesn't mean it has to. I'm wondering if this presupposes an autonomy that a lot of the younger generations may not have because of the fact that techno their idea of these social um, uh, kind of contingencies are technological. So yeah. you, made the, uh, you made the example of um, a German football club, the stadium going down. So during COVID, no more Lions Arena, no more Bayern Munich. I'm sure Bayern's uh, uh, fans that go to the stadium were very much affected. My answer would be, you know who isn't affected? The majority of Bayern fans, because they're not going to those stadiums. They're watching it around the world online, and that had nothing to and do that's, with it. That's true for Bayern. Right? And but, that's how- but, but Bayern is a global football club. I, I'm sorry? Bayern is a global football club. I understand, but, but the idea of the football club being a, I mean, this is going into a different situation, but I think it's tangentially related. The idea of a football club being a community club is not something that a lot of football fans grew up with, right? The idea of a football club for a majority of football fans is a digitized and a marketed entity. I knew, I knew about Barcelona. Yeah, I, yeah. I understand your point. I, right? understand the point. I, so I knew about Barcelona because point. it's a brand. Yeah, yeah, but it's not the point. Because it doesn't okay. matter. You, but so if that's the problem with the football club, then we think of another example. Because it is not about the football club. It is about the idea that people do things and it's interesting that you say this because the more commercialized, marketized sure. mm -hmm. is the other one. So, so there are there is this kind of you know, and Berlin football clubs are are, are fan owned, right? Yeah, yeah it's all fans. Yes, yeah. fifty plus one and everything. Yeah. We want them to leave. Sure. Go to the primary. Yeah. Um, but um, the, um, I think the point. So, so yes, I think your first part of the question is more interesting. Okay. And and very important. Because that is a question that I think is really something that I that I don't know the answer to, and and that so this this dependency on this digital forms of expression because it changes us as much as we change it, right? Right. So like, it, if we grew up in it, that's our kind of starting point for a lot of younger people. So these, when, when you go back to oh, the public sphere and everything, that's something that is not only, it's not really even antiquated. It's not an excuse. It's something, but like, is, there, is there autonomy there is my question. If, there, if that's their starting point is this digitized platform, what, I mean, what, yeah, I'm, is there, I'm where's their choice? Yeah, I'm thinking of an analogy that may be complete, go completely wrong, but I'm just thinking about and that is smoking. No, no, please, yeah. Smoking is an interesting example. Because something very strange happened with smoking. When I was in high school, teachers smoked in the classroom. Mm -hmm. and there was nothing strange about it. There was nothing strange about it. We smoked with our teachers in the classroom. There was nothing strange about it. Now we can say, yes, but smoking is bad for your health. And digitalization is not. I'm not so sure about that, but who knows? It doesn't really matter. It shows that something that is a completely well-accepted part, and I smoked for a very long time, so it was part of my hand. You know, it's part of my existence. It's part of my identity. It's part of all these things. But it didn't mean it couldn't be given it up. And it didn't mean that as a public, as a, as a society, we weren't able to say, no, 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 we're not doing this anymore. So I honestly, but this becomes very non-academic now. I, I'm not completely convinced that if we took it away from you, and younger generations. Then what? What would happen if we could take it back and say, no, 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 this app thing after all, especially with the platform economy, this app thing after all was actually not a good idea. And I know we can't, but it would be an interesting experiment because that is exactly the technological bluff. The technological bluff says because the technology is there and people are used to it, they need it, they have to do it. Maybe not. Oh, interesting. Good. Yeah. But that's just one. What do you? What do you? Oh, sorry. Yeah, no, go ahead. I was gonna, just going to say we have about four minutes, oh, okay. so a couple more so questions. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. I was just going to ask, what do you think needs to happen to shift? Because it's like 
The pen and getting sped up our oh we use an app to get our coffee now. Yes. So what do you think needs to happen to like to swing back for us to be, you know, healthier for like you said to you know, smoking it was it was almost a big shift, it was the yeah. health issue. What needs to like is there a big event that has to happen in order for people to see what you're seeing? Maybe I'm wrong, right? Depending on what I'm saying, and that, maybe maybe nothing needs to happen. Maybe everybody's fine. This is me being in trouble. No, no, no. That's a joke. And and see, this is I I the the, the, the issue I have with a question like that is it's a good question, and yet it isn't necessarily where I see my public role or academic role as a sociologist. It's more that I want to sort of take things and say, well, you're always looking at it like this. Now I'm turning it for you. And you know what? It looks really good. Now you may say, well, that's OK. I'm perfectly happy with how things are. I don't mind. I don't mind if there's a brutalization of public space. I don't mind if homeless people get burned because nobody's watching. I don't mind if people don't travel. travel travel public transport because I'm happy sitting on my sofa, cocooned, having my deliveries. Fine. I don't mind that. You know, I'm not saying you can't, but I do think we need to think about the social consequences of us doing this. Because in the long term, like that may not necessarily, and that goes back to the question that we had before about what, why do we need to be in public space? Because I think that there is a necessity to have a various mm -hmm bright variety of using of the downtown. It goes also back to your question, like I don't necessarily want to go to places where I or go where to places where I'm, where I'm anonymous. That's already where we are. And we was having this similar conversation with co colleagues in Bogota where I was in November. And of course Bogota is a city where this is long past. You don't go and walk down the street in Bogota. Not even if you're from there. You know, people do, but you know, this has to be qualified by race, class, ethnicity, and all sorts of things. So it's too general. But I think you get the idea of, of what I'm trying to say. So, so that that you know, gated communities, all these kind of developments, I think indicate that there is a that yeah. But so as long as you live in this gated community, of course, you can be. can work for you. And whether you want that or not, that for me is a political project, right? That is. Yeah, last question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so a few months ago, I saw uh, something for a Zara clothing company. Uh, they opened a store on Metaverse. Then I can go there as a user uh, and I can go see a rack, ch check out the rack of clothes, and other I can see other users there, and I can actually talk to them, uh, like when I when I'm close to them. So it's kind of like you know we have uh, fluid encounters there, and we can casually learn from uh, other people if we talk to them. Uh, and like back to his point, like uh, you can be anonymous. I can just use a username and like a face or whatever I want, and I don't have to be worried about like if that person knows me or not and I am safe there like you know it's not that I don't like if this person might be someone that I don't want to uh, in interact with uh, so <laughs> I'm sorry <laughs> 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 yeah. so yeah um, don't you think like it's that that kind of spaces can uh, replicate the public space that you want and like it kind of adds more value to that because it's anonymous, it's m more safe. And, yeah. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> so I guess, like, I think there's a whole other thing you can learn online. But you got to know where to go to find it. And this is where I think, because in my understanding of digital technology, a lot of it is organized by algorithm and not by openness. So when I run into you on the train station 
and say, well, we're not running to you. We take three persons, and we're, I mean, this one person is going to the station, and he runs into two people who are of the same size, hugging each other. This third person is going to see something. That if his algorithms are linked to the music he listens, the, fir the, the fir television programs he sees, the games he plays, he may never encounter other than in terms of hate speech. So in that sense, I think that it's impossible, but that's like the last point of the talk, the thing that I haven't, that I'm sort of thinking further. I don't think it's possible to create a replacement of those kind of things in a, internet that is owned by big companies that want us to go in certain directions and not in other that are I, I, I don't think that that is that, that is possible but maybe I'm I'm just not seeing it the other thing that I find interesting in that idea is that I haven't figured it out. But I, but I think there was something about our bodies, about the fact that we are three-dimensional shaped objects. And there's theory about this. This is why I'm so, so careful, because I really don't know the literature on this at all. I have no idea what I'm talking about. But given that I have no, no idea what I'm talking about, let me say one, two sentences. I think that that matters. And I haven't figured out why it matters, but I think we all, I mean, and I don't think it works. I, yes, you can pick information. So getting information, if you know where to look for it, you can do that digitally and, and find if you, but still the question is, how do you know what to ask, right? Because how do you get out of that, what you're always looking for? How do you put in new search words when you're at Zara instead of jeans or something like that? So, so that I, and how do you avoid that, that Zara is going to suggest to you who you're going to talk to? because it's a person that's also wearing jeans. So, so that is the things that I think is difficult. And then, the, yeah, I know, I need to wrap up. So, the, but then, <laughs> see, the talk is just a break, right? You're fine, you're seeing it really in life now. So, but, but if we start to think about what is a just, cohesive, and democratic city, if we want to think about that, which we don't have to do, but if we want to think about that, then I think we need to think about what it means when we do everything in our houses and we have no more of this kind of, which we've been talking about here in London as well, like people don't go to the shop to buy things, while people used to go smoke in classrooms. You know, you can go to the store and buy things. You don't have to order online. We have an order online ban in my house. Like we never use Uber. We never order food. Well, but I'm not there. My voice sometimes. So, you, 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 I, so, 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 so. I don't know. That, but it's not about me, and it's not about what we do, and it's not about individual behavior. But I think it is about something that we have in communication as persons, like that is that is in that is in bodies that matters. And I think it matters. And this is what what people that write about, you know, sort of affects fact and sociology of fact and also talk about is about the necessity of resonance. As a scholar in Germany, Harpoot Rosa, who writes about resonance. Resonance is something that emerges between people without necessarily having to talk to each other. There's a sense that they are that there's a sense of connection. And I think that is not possible with an avatar. Well no, he thinks it that. So Thank you very Thanks everybody for coming. Thanks for a great presentation, a great lecture, and a great discussion. So, thank you.